Good morning. I hope you're all doing really well. We are moving rapidly from summer straight into winter here. It was almost 70 degrees out yesterday, and today it's 25 degrees and we've got freezing rain. It also brings me to the point that we're moving in the lectionary from the season of ordinary, where we have the ordered or numbered seasons of readings, into Advent. And so between now and then, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna focus on the readings out of the lectionary for these main videos. I also wanted to remind you that I'm giving away this English study Bible. It is completely hermetically sealed and so it'll be mailed to you. But the instructions for that are in the Expresso videos that I have on this channel. Number three, I review study Bibles and why you need one. And in particular, I go through some of the details on the ESV. So take a look at that. Today, I'm gonna to be looking at Psalm 1, which is the lectionary reading for this Sunday. Psalm 1 is really important because when the ancient scribes were collecting and compiling the book of Psalms, they collected all these different collections of Psalms and then they put them together into one work, probably somewhere around 400 to 600 BC. We're not exactly sure when but they placed this Psalm at the very start of the book of Psalms. And the reason for that is Psalm 1 serves as the gateway or the introductory Psalm. So grab a cup of coffee and let's dive into the introduction to the book of Psalms. In case you're new to the channel, you're watching the Caffeinated Bible. My name is David Paris, and I've spent an inordinate amount of time of my life studying the biblical text, especially the New Testament, and then teaching that at seminaries and other institutions around the world. The goal of this channel is to take what I've been teaching within the four walls of a seminary room and make it available to a much wider audience. If you like this material and you find it beneficial, be sure to subscribe give it a thumbs up, and also share it with other people. That's perhaps the biggest way that you could help me if you like this channel. Psalm 1 is the introductory psalm or the opening for the book of Psalms. It sets the tracks that we are to run on if we are to correctly understand the psalms and approach them in the correct manner. Psalm 1 is organized around two contrasting ways of life or two different paths we can take. One path leads to being blessed, the other to perishing. So let's read Psalm 1 and then take a look at how it's structured so as we walk through it, we understand how all the parts fit together into the larger whole. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its seasons, and its leaf does not wither. In all he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Now if we take a look at this psalm and look at its structure, we notice that it follows sort of an A, B, C order, and then it walks you back out in the reverse order, C, B, A. So the first idea is line A. Blessed is the man. Then point B is this whole idea that they have no association with the wicked. We see this with who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Point C is this metaphor about a tree. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit and its seasons, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. Now notice that we're going to back out now C, B, A. We're going to go in the reverse order. So instead of a tree, now we have the wicked being compared to chaff. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff that the wind drives away. In contrast to the just who have nothing to do with the wicked, the wicked now have no place with the judge in B or what we call B prime. 
Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous. And then finally, in contrast to blessed is the man, now we close off with a prime, and it says, but the way of the wicked will perish. Now, the reason why I show you the structure is because in order to understand the parts, you need to understand the whole. And in order to understand the big picture or the whole, you also need to understand the parts. These two ideas, the parts and the whole, constantly interact with each other as you're interpreting a biblical text. Now, this idea of being blessed or a share in the Hebrew Bible conveys this idea of someone who is fortunate, that they are happy, that they are blessed. And it's often used to speak about their relationship to God. In this psalm, a person is blessed, not because they have been lucky or blessed with something. Rather, a person is blessed because of a lifestyle that they have adopted and how they live and carry out their life and transactions with other people. Now, within this particular psalm, especially in the next three lines, it's really associated with how they affiliate or how they don't affiliate with unrighteous people. The psalmist uses three metaphors to explain this idea. Walk, stand, and sit. So let's take a look at these three metaphors. The person who is blessed does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. Walking is a metaphor that is used in just about every language and culture around the world to explain how we live our life. Now, the reason why it's used this way is because walking is our primary means of getting from point A to point B. As a result, it ties in with this larger meta metaphor of life is a journey. Our journey begins at birth and it ends at death. And how do we traverse that journey that we're on as life? Well, we walk. And so we have all these expressions that explain this. That was a tough road to follow. I overcame all sorts of obstacles. We really went through a desert back then. We have all these metaphorical images that we use that convey this idea that life is a journey. And how do we carry out that journey? Well, we primarily carry it out by walking. Now, perhaps the best example of this idea of walking and the journey of life is Robert Frost's poem, The Road Not Taken. In that poem, he writes, Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both. And be one traveler long I stood, and looked down one as far as I could, to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other, just as fair, having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear, though as for that the passing there. And both that morning equally lay, in leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day, yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Now, I think Robert Frost's poem can be read as an exhortation for us to take the correct path. And this is what the psalmist lays out for us here. He's presenting two paths that we can follow with our lives, and they want us to pick the correct one. Now, to walk in the counsel of the wicked paints a picture that the path we're on is laid out and being directed or mapped by the wicked, that we are following their advice, their counsel as to how we should live our life and carry out our business. And the psalmist lets us know right at the very start here that we do not do that. We have to pick the other path. The second line picks up and develops this idea only in a slightly different image. Instead of walking in the counsel of the wicked, now we are standing in their path. One conveys action, we're walking. The other conveys location that we are standing in it. And in both cases, this is something we are to reject. We are not located in their path and we are not following their path. We have to pick the alternate route. Now this idea is going to be picked up in verse 6, further down in the psalm, where it says, 
The Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. And this idea of way and path here are all the same word in the Hebrew. It's just being translated slightly differently in English. So walk, stand, this brings us to the third one, sit. Now in my last Espresso series, the one that I filmed with Sunset, and you gotta watch that because I think it turned out really well. I just sat there and talked, all the action was being done behind me. But one of the key things we need to realize is how our world today is different from that of the biblical authors. And in regards to sitting or having a seat, this is one of the areas that really differs. Today, we have all kinds of seats. We have big overstuffed chairs. We've got stools that spin around. We've got desk chairs. We've got chairs in our bedrooms. We've got chairs everywhere. We have chairs in waiting rooms. In the ancient world, that was not the case. Chairs were very, very special and they were a rarity. They were reserved to the extremely wealthy, the powerful, and the rulers. So when it talks about sitting in the seat of scoffers, what it's talking about is that this scoffer is a ruler or someone in position and authority and wealth, and they're the person who has that seat. And by metaphorical extension, when it says that we do not sit in the seat of scoffers, it's talking about that we don't associate with rulers like this. Now, in the ancient world, this would have been very, very challenging because you had to be in the good graces of the local authorities that were over your region. But if that person is a scoffer, what the psalmist says is that you don't sit in their seat. You do not associate with them. You don't try and get in their good graces. Now, in order to understand this word scoff, I'm going to read you some definitions left somebody thinks out there that I'm trying to apply this to one particular person. But scoffing, according to the freeonlinedictionary.com, says that this is contemptuous or jeering laughter to ridicule someone else. The Hebrew word litz conveys the idea of mocking, scorning other people, talking big, bragging, and that's from the Kalmberg Mount's Concise Hebrew Aramaic Dictionary. The theological word book of the Old Testament defines it this way. The scoffer may be described as proud and haughty, incorrigible, resistant to all reproof, and hating any rebuke. The psalmist here is giving us warnings or instructions for our life. We don't walk in the counsel of the wicked. We don't stand in their path. And in particular with regard to scoffers, we don't sit in their seat. We don't associate with people in power who are like this. We don't sit with them. We don't ingratiate ourselves to them. We don't follow the direction that they're trying to take us in. If verse one was primarily negative, we don't do these things. Verse two now presents the positive. This is what the blessed man's life should be like. That the blessed man is a person who meditates on God's word day and night. Now the psalmist here is not talking about a Sunday morning service or maybe a 15 minute devotional sometime during the day. It's creating a picture of someone whose life is saturated with thoughts about God's word. This image of meditating day and night is to express the comprehensiveness of what we're to do here during the light, during the dark, when we're awake and supposedly when we're supposed to sleep, we are to be thinking about God's word. Now in verse three here, we drop into the central section, this C section within the outline. And in particular, it makes this contrast between a tree and chaff. The blessed person is like a tree planted by streams of water. Because I live in Colorado, this is a metaphorical image that I understand pretty well. Colorado is a semi-arid region, just like Israel was during that day, and trees don't naturally grow everywhere. If you don't water them, the only place trees grow are down along the streams or the rivers. The same thing in ancient Israel. The trees grew along these wadis or streams that's where they could find water and they, they could live. It creates this picture, once again, of the path that we're walking. We don't plan ourselves out on the countryside or the hillside there where there is no water. Rather, the blessed person is someone who lives, dwells, and inhabits a space next to the stream of water. It also conveys this image that the tree's roots are going down deep 
to get this water. Once again, just like meditating on God's word day or night, now the tree has sent its roots down. It is rooted and grounded into this space next to where God has chosen, or I should say where the streams of living water are. Mm. Man, you just gotta get some living water every now and then. Okay, where was I? Oh yeah, I remember where I was. <clears throat> Look at all the metaphors that are being used here. Walk, stand, sit, day and night, like a tree by living waters. And now it gets extended to this idea that they bear fruit in a season and their leaves don't wither. This is not just a tree there, but this is a tree that is bearing fruit, it's very rich and productive, and it's healthy, it has good leaves on it. The idea of bearing fruit is important because it conveys this idea that that tree is not just being blessed for its own sake, but for all those around it. In other words, when you come up to that tree, you can have some fruit off it. The blessed person is not someone who just receives blessings from God for their own life, they are blessed by God because of how they have lived their lives. And that blessing doesn't stop with them, but it percolates out to other people. Just as a healthy fruit tree planted by a stream of water will naturally flourish, so the person who doesn't walk, stand, or sit with scoffers or wicked people should naturally prosper as well, according to this psalm. Verse 4 continues this theme found in this C section in the middle of the psalm. The positive one in verse 3, the negative one in verse 4. If the positive one, the blessed person, is compared to a tree by streams of living water, in verse 4, the wicked are like chaff. Now, as opposed to a large tree, the wicked are just the opposite. They are like chaff. Now, chaff was the little bits of husk or perhaps dried up pieces of leaf or stem that got mixed in with the seed or the grain when they were doing the harvest. And what they would do is they would wait for a slight breeze and they would take and they would throw the harvest up into the air and the breeze would blow this really light chaff away. But the heavier and more weighty seed would then fall back to the ground where it's at. So this idea that the wicked are like the chaff brings across two ideas as opposed to a tree, which is heavy and immovable, the chaff isn't like that. It's very light and it's blown away. It's here today and gone with the slightest wind. The second thing is, as opposed to a tree which produces fruit and its leaves don't wither, the chaff is already dead. It's dried up. And the fact that it's being blown away speaks about its ultimate destination. In verse 5, now we move back to ring B. In the first B, we saw that the blessed person doesn't walk, stand, or sit with scoffers or wicked people. Now in verse five, we get the converse of that and we look at the person who is unjust. The unjust person will not stand in judgment, nor do they have a place within the congregation of the right. Now let's take this first idea of standing in judgment. To stand in judgment goes back to this idea in the ancient Near East and within Israel, that when you were bringing accusations or charges against someone, you would stand up and make these in the presence of other people. The psalmist here says that the unjust do not have a place. They are not allowed to make accusations like that against the righteous. The second thing is, is that they have no place in the congregation of the righteous. In verse in the first part, verse B, it says we don't walk, we don't stand, and we don't sit with unrighteous people and scoffers. In this section here, it says that we don't even allow them into sort of our community. They are to be kept out. In the first line of verse 6, we get the reason why. It says that God knows the way of the righteous. And this goes back to verse 1, where it talks about we don't walk, we don't stand, and we don't sit in the seat of scoffers. Now here we get this picture, the reason why we don't let them stand in judgment, nor do we have them within our assemblies, is because God knows the way of the righteous. This idea that God knows the way of the righteous conveys two ideas, I think, here. First off, that God knows the path that we're walking on. And the second thing is it conveys this idea of protection, 
or perhaps we would say within this psalm that he blesses our steps, that as a result of this walking this path, we are a blessed person. This psalm closes with a very stark warning that the wicked will perish. It's a challenge to us. If we don't walk properly, if we don't stand in the correct path, if we don't dissociate from the seat of scoffers, then this psalm lays down this warning that perhaps we are going to end up like chaff. We're going to be blown away and will perish. At the very beginning, I talked about how Psalm 1 is the gateway psalm into the book of Psalms. This sets the trajectory, how we are to approach the Psalms, and how we are to read them. Now, let me explain by analogy to mountain biking what I think Psalm 1 is doing here as the gateway psalm. In mountain biking, if you come up to a really difficult trail, hopefully the trail builders will have incorporated what we call a squirrel catcher. This is some sort of feature that's technically difficult for you to get up, over, around, or down that then lets you know what to expect further on down that trail. And if you can't successfully ride that squirrel catcher, then you should realize that perhaps I shouldn't be going down this trail. In a certain sense, Psalm 1 is the squirrel catcher for the book of Psalms. It lets you know the path that the Psalms are going to take, what it's going to be like, and how our lives should be structured as we're reading them. If your life does not line up with the images in Psalm 1, then in a certain sense, I think you need to back up and get things right in your life first before you proceed on with the book of Psalms. Let me close once again with the words from Robert Frost, The Road Not Taken. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Having just gone through this squirrel catcher psalm, I just wanted to say I appreciate all of you who have been watching these videos. I hope they're beneficial to you. If they are, be sure to subscribe so you know when I produce new videos. On my part, it's an incredible blessing to spend a couple days preparing and researching this material, writing it up, and then thinking about how I'm going to present it in a video. It really helps me to meditate on God's Word, as this psalm says. Don't forget, also, I'm giving away this English Study Bible. You need to go over to the Expresso videos to see the instructions and how to enter to get a chance to win one of these. Until next week, I hope you're walking the right path, you're standing in the right way, and you're sitting with the right people. Until then, peace. Thank you.